Coming up next, CityNet 30 takes you downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Portland. Live weekly coverage of City Club is made possible in part by TCI and is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. Good afternoon. Welcome to the City Club of Portland and Maestro James DePriest talk on the value of our arts to our community. I'm Pete Heuser, president of the City Club. Our program today is sponsored by Providence Health Systems, Portland General Electric, and Wells Fargo Bank. We continue to be very grateful for their corporate support. Now on Wednesday of next week, February 17th, we have another, another of our Assumptions of Growth series of forums. This forum will feature Metro Councilor Ed Washington, who will talk on the subject of South North Light Rail, what's next? That'll be at 5.45 to 7 p.m. at Patty's Restaurant downtown. Next Friday, a week from today, here at the Multnomah Club, we'll hear City Commissioner Charlie Hale, who will talk to us. That's here at the Multnomah Club. Now in the upcoming weeks, what we thought we'd do is have uh, chairs of each of our issue committees talk to you briefly about what each of their committees are doing this year. So before we move to today's program, I've invited Margaret Eichmann of the City Club's Arts and Culture Issue Committee, who's gonna talk to us about the activities of her committee. Margaret. Thank you very much. The Board of Governors invited me to tell you something about the series of events that have been sponsored by the Arts and Culture Committee, which is a standing committee of the City Club. We've been working over the last months on a series that we call the Arts and Their Public Value. Today's talk is one of the talks in that series. About a year and a half ago, a report by the American Assembly called The Arts and Their Public Purposes came to the attention of the Arts and Culture Committee. The report motivated us to begin planning how we could bring these important ideas we found in the report to City Club. We began by discussing with a group of people from the community, what do you believe is the public value of the arts? Not the value that you as an individual feel ab about the arts, but to us as a community. As you might guess, the answer to that question is multifaceted for most people. The value is seen in terms of dollars and cents, in aesthetic terms, in terms of urban assessments such as livability, safety, and caring. Next, the Arts and Culture Committee planned a way to bring this question about the public value to the whole club. We decided to offer a series of events all focused on our topic question. Part of it was simply a matter of packaging. We used standard city club formats, Friday lunches, breakfast meetings, and brown bag discussions. But we also did something new. We partnered with the Regional Arts and Culture Council, which gave us some staff support over the past nine months from me, and which shared some expenses for this effort. In October, Bill Ivey came to a meeting of the National Assembly of State Arts Administrators. Um, city club became a co-sponsor of his address. The second event with a major speaker we arranged on our own. In November, Senator Alan Simpson spoke about funding for the arts, which he did a couple of years ago for the NEA. Our third major event is our speaker today. Um, as with most speakers, um, we, or as I was gonna say that the, aside from speakers, we also wanted to include a chance for people to have an opportunity to discuss ideas. And so we planned these three brown bag discussions um, the third of which is still coming up. You haven't missed it. It'll be on March the 4th, and it's called The Arts and Portland's Community. Each discussion has featured knowledgeable panelists and a skillful facilitator and has allowed time for attendees to have a wonderful discussion about the, the discussion under, under uh, consideration. Finally, to sort of wrap up our series, we are inviting City Club members to crash our arts education conference that the Regional Arts and Culture Council is planning for April 8th. 
There will be a fabulous panel discussion, which I hope you don't miss, during the noon hour with Dr. Howard Gardner from Harvard, Beverly Stein, Benjamin Canada, and Jennifer Fletcher, the Grant High School student who raised $100,000 for the arts program with her Jackson Brown concert last fall. The topic is called Creativity, Leadership, and the Arts, and a registration form for this panel discussion will be published in the City Club Bulletin, and you can pick up a copy of a registration form on the back table. And finally, we'll produce a report which will package all of these ideas into one informational report. So we thank City Club very much, all the members of the Arts and Culture Committee, for helping us bring these ideas to, to all of your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. If you'd like to attend any of those meetings, you heard uh, when and where they're going to be. If you have questions, call the club office. If you'd like to join the committee or just attend one of their regular monthly meetings, uh, call the club office and they can let you know when those are. We thank you for all the work you're doing on behalf of the community and the city club. Our board host today is Nikki Lynch. Nikki is a financial consultant with Merrill Lynch. She's going to ask the first question of our speaker today. Then we'll open it, as usual, up to City Club members only in the audience. Now, as I mentioned last week, we'll take just one question from every questioner. If you have a second question, feel free to ask it. But first, go to the end of the line so that everybody gets to ask their one question. Now, I think today we probably won't have anybody wanting to debate Mr. DePriest on the value of arts to our community, but remember, this is not the forum for a debate. I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Maestro James DePriest, the music director and conductor of the Oregon Symphony. Mr. DePriest first came to Portland to take lead of the Oregon Symphony in 1980. During the DePriest tenure, the symphony has gone from part-time to full-time, has moved into a new concert hall, and works under a new recording contract. He has guided the Oregon Symphony through its performances and recordings into the ranks of major U.S. orchestras. Now, I think we all know about his musical heritage. His aunt, Marian Anders Anderson, the famous contralto, recognized his gift and inspired the young man. He got a chance to return the favor when she spent the last part of her life living with him and his wife, Jeanette, here in Portland. Now, prior to his 30th birthday, Mr. DePriest was selected by Leonard Bernstein to be an assistant conductor of the New York Philharmonic before he was 30 years old. He also served as associate conductor to the National Symphony Orchestra in Washington and was music director of the Quebec Symphony. He has been music director and conductor of the Monte Carlo, Phil Monte Carlo Philharmonic as well. Now, he's been much in demand as a guest conductor, regularly performing all over Europe and with the New York Philharmonic, the Boston Symphony, the Philadelphia Orchestra, and the Chicago Symphony. You probably knew that, but did you know that he published two books on poetry? He says that uh, if he could do it, he'd want to make a living doing that. Now, I had a chance to speak this last week with Michael Foxman, who's concert ma master of the Oregon Symphony. And Michael shared with me one of the comments he's heard from guest soloists like Isaac Stern and Andre Watts. They talk about his gentle soul. And anyone who's heard the Oregon Symphony knows you can hear that gentle soul in his music. There's certainly no one more qualified to talk about the value of arts to our community. He's entitled his talk, Bottom Liners Beware, There's Another Set of Books. Please join me in welcoming Maestro James DePriest. Thank you very much, Pete. I see um, many friends here who were here when I came to the Oregon Symphony. I see Mike Lindbergh, who has been um, a particular source of encouragement and, uh, and strength for the orchestra and for me personally. And seeing Mike reminds me 
in a um, not purely political sense of um, the recently departed Mildred Schwab. And when I first came here, I had signed my contract. Phil Bogue was president of the association at the time. And I signed my contract, and there was a luncheon. And speaking at that luncheon and introducing me was dear Mildred. And I'll never forget it, because first opportunity to come into the city and to meet someone like Mildred um, identified the city as more than the, uh, the centerpiece in an iconoclastic state. It was an iconoclastic city. And I'll never forget what Mildred said. It was, it was vintage Schwab. Mildred said, Mr. Priest, we want to welcome you to Portland. And we all are very grateful and very happy that you're here and you've decided to come to the Oregon Symphony. And that orchestra, the orchestra you're taking over, was really built during the time of Larry Smith. And he's left an orchestra worthy of someone of your talents to come here. And uh, as we recognize you, we want to salute Larry and to thank him for everything that he's done and wish him the very best <laughs> as he leaves us, just as we will wish you the very best when you leave. <laughs> Although my leaving is, is several days away, I, uh, I often remember with fondness, dear, uh, dear Mildred. Um, the subject of my remarks today have, has as much to do with past experiences that I've had when I have been called upon to, to go before, for example, Sid Yates' committee, Congressman Yates' committee in Washington, on behalf of the budget for the National Endowment for the Arts. I may have shared with previous City Club audiences the incident that marked my testimony, the period of my testimony. It was some years ago, and we were, as usual, those of us in the arts community, trying to go to Washington to avoid having the budget cut for the National Endowment for the Arts. And the forces had been marshaled, and they were considerable, not just those of us who were directly in the arts, but Lou Harris, the pollster, who indicated that there was a considerable uh, basis of support throughout the nation for people having their tax dollars go to the support of the arts, that it was something that Congress could uh, enter into without fear that they were going to alienate their constituents. And I spoke on behalf of the arts and the degree to which they are as important as defense. They are our defense against becoming dehumanized and our defense against becoming uncivilized human beings. We talk so much about the quality of life. We pay lip service to the quality of life. But when it comes to defining those attributes that we want to have as a nation, we often ignore the fact that we have eliminated, in many cases, the arts from that discussion. So we all talked essentially about the same thing, that there was support, considerable support. But the day was stolen by Elliot Feld. Elliot Feld Ballet, and Elliot had come from New York. And Elliot had been through this drill before. And without in any sense being rude, he said, you know, Congressman, I've been here before, and I am getting just a little bit tired. Every few years, every time there's a budget problem, to have to come here and justify the pittance you give us to do the job of the National Endowment for the Arts. He said, I come, Mr. DePriest, others come, and what we're telling you is 
true, it's very important. We think that some of you know it's important, the rest of you couldn't care less. But I've done some calculations. And he said, I, I've really figured out that what we're asking for the National Endowment for the Arts is roughly equivalent to the cost of a foot of a Trident submarine. He said, we can cut out all of this nonsense if in the future all submarines are shortened by one foot <laughs> since everything looks larger underwater anyway. <laughs> well, we, we talk about the importance of the arts to our children and the importance of artistic institutions to our communities. But fundamentally, what we need to remind ourselves of is the fact that arts institutions and artists provide for us unique visions. They are decanting parallel universes for our delight, for our amazement, for our shock sometimes. And those visions alter in our calibration of, of meaning. Whether you go to the art museum, or you go to the theater, or you go to a, a, a chamber music concert, or to the Oregon Symphony, you are in the process of participating in a spectacular metamorphosis. A metamorphosis that unfortunately we take for granted, and many of the people in this room, practically all of the people in this room, consumers, regular consumers of the arts. So this is much like preaching to the preached, but I think that every once in a while we need to pull back from the wonders that we absorb and with some recognition of the fact that they are wonders, reflect upon what happens. We go into essentially dark caverns and silently commune with artists, aware that changes are taking place. And the changes began, in the case of a symphony orchestra, for example, far away from the concert hall. They began with the terrifying confrontation of the composer with a blank page. And from the ether of the dawning thoughts of imagination comes a note, and then a series of notes, and then the imaginings of instruments playing those notes, and the imagining of those sounds, and a work emerges. And the work exists in the hieroglyphics of musical notation but it doesn't exist in the real world of the real sounds to which everyone can relate. Somehow, these blueprints for a sonic superstructure come to the orchestra and hear these workers, magicians, who come on stage with oddly shaped boxes and pieces of metal sit together and transform these singularly non-prepossessing objects into instruments that are capable of producing coherent sounds that are not by any means noise, but music. So the first transformation from a blank page to notes, to sounds. And then the sounds are transmitted to you, an audience, because the composer, even though when the work is finished, has the satisfaction of knowing that the internal, the internal consistency 
that has been maintained in, in an artistic way in producing that he can be proud of, that that's just part of the story. Communication is, is intended. Very few composers I know go around a city saying, look at my piece of music. That's not sufficient. The music needs to be heard, and it needs to be heard, and once it is heard, how do you translate these notes into how you feel? You go to an art museum and you look at a painting and you see essentially an assemblage of colors and textures on a canvas. And yet you are elated, moved, disturbed, intrigued. The powerful metamorphosis that takes place is incredible. As an interpretive artist, there is no mistake that I make in placing myself in the same category as the creative artist, the composer. You must recognize that the concert hall, particularly, is a place of recreative energies, not creative energies. And those of us who are interpreters uh, delight sometimes in working with composers who are alive. I know that's a threat to, uh, to some concert goers, <laughs> composers who are actually living. <laughs> but I've had the opportunity of conducting premieres of, of compositions in the presence of, their, of composers. And composers are amazed. They may be happy, they may be disgruntled from time to time, but they're always surprised because the sounds that are produced are not purely the sounds that they envisioned. They're richer than, deeper than, more structured than, more beautiful. But beauty can get you into some traps. I remember conducting a premiere of a work by a distinguished American composer with the Chicago Symphony. And this composer came armed with a legal pad and a stopwatch. <laughs> and seemed humorless. <laughs> and as I'm conducting this premiere, I happened to conduct the second movement at a tempo far slower than that indicated, that he had indicated in the score. And he, of course, noted the license that I had taken, but to my surprise had bought into my conception of the piece, my interpretation of the piece. And the reason that I had chosen the tempo was purely because of what I considered a searingly beautiful melody and rich harmonies that combined in such a way that forced me to respond to that concept of time. And when he said, yes, that, that really works, I said to myself, well, he must also have been moved by what he had written. Not at all. For him, music was a succession, a pure succession of notes, mathematics, ordered and structured. If there was an emotional consequent, it was an unfortunate byproduct. <laughs> And although this is a, a valid compositional posture, music escapes such artificial bounds and manages nonetheless to touch us. There's a legendary story about the great conductor of the Boston Symphony, Serge Kusevitsky, who invited Bela Bartok for the premiere of Concerto for Orchestra. And here is one of the great composers, one of the great conductors, and one of the great orchestras. Bartok was furnished with a legal pad and a pencil and asked to sit in that hallowed hall and to note any of his observations about the performance of the orchestra and the interpretation of Maestro Kusevitsky. And in the course of rehearsing and performing in this dress rehearsal, this 36-minute work, Bartok is writing furiously, filling page after page. 
and there was a break, and Kusevitsky and Bartok went into the green room, and voices were raised. Disagreement reigned. Doors were slammed. Kusevitsky returned to the orchestra and said, colleagues, I am delighted to report to you that in principle, Mr. Bartok was very pleased with everything we did. <laughs> it's true that we do have, as interpreters, we do have a bit of, of license when the composer whose work we happen to be conducting has passed on to his or her earth, uh, heavenly reward. And when we're conducting a work by a composer who happens to be conveniently dead, we preface every egocentric excess and every libertine wallowing with, I'm sure the composer intended this. <laughs> but what really happens to us on the stage is that we are transformed by the greatness of the music we perform. A symphony orchestra is very much like a human computer, and it's only as good as its software. And the software that goes into an orchestra, if it scales the heights of truly great utterances, manages to make us different people as performers. But we've only dealt with the metamorphosis from blank page to music to performance, we haven't concluded the equation in dealing with what happens to you when you go to a concert. Music for me is a succession of perishing particles of sound that are made coherent by expectation and memory. And all of that is done by you no matter how sophisticated or unsophisticated, how frequently or infrequently you visit the concert hall, you are participants nonetheless. I'm old enough to remember radio. I'm old enough to remember drama on radio. And when I was growing up, the magic box in the home was the radio. And we were all individual participants. It was a collaborative effort. The transmission didn't work if we didn't participate. Television came along, and overnight we were transformed from participants, collaborators, to spectators. We went from being in control of everything to being in control of nothing. And we bought it because the technology was so exciting, so different, so new, it, have, it had even more magic than radio. And we didn't realize what we were giving up as we were leaping forward. Technology is seductive and it's pervasive. I remember a time when a good part of this nation sat watching test patterns on black and white television sets. <laughs> it didn't matter what was on television. It's the fact that it was on. Well, radio drama disappeared in large measure, certainly in this country. And it's possible that there is in the onslaught of technology the desire to have the synthetic rather than the real. In many domains, it's very difficult even to find the real, the original, the authentic. The synthetic is readily available, very often it's cheaper, more attractively packaged. And over time, people forget. 
And maybe it wasn't so important. It's possible to get to a point in which a young child says, Daddy, what was a tree? It's very easy to be seduced by technology. There was a time when if you wanted to hear music played, you, have to, you had to physically be in the same room as the musicians. Then years later, radio made it possible for you to be some distance away, but there was a degradation in the quality of the sound, but still. And then there were phonograph records scratchy phonograph records. But for many people, the majority of the people in the world, they never saw Toscanini conduct, but they heard his concerts. When I would go to Europe after the death of my aunt and people would say, oh, I remember growing up in Prague and hearing recordings of Marian Anderson. They never saw her never heard her in concert. So the technology had made it possible for an approximation of witnessing the event itself. FM radio, digital sound, all of these things made it closer and closer and brought us closer and closer to a synthetic representation of what was going on that was not too far from the original. I know this sounds like the same kind of concern that people in television were expressing, that once they got going, that there was going to be the demise of, of movies and that people were not going to go to sporting events. And we know that what has happened is that even though you can have better than in the stadium television coverage, instant replay and you can sit in the comfort of your home and watch most sporting events with greater clarity than being in the stadium that the stadiums are full they're building more stadiums and why is that it's because people well i'll tell you why it's not it's not because foot, football fans happen to be masochistic spendthrifts gregarious who want to sit in the cold, hard seats, and yell to the top of their voices. There's more to it than that. And the nexus of their contentment and the nexus of their appreciation of what goes on is to be a, an eyewitness in three-dimensional terms and a participant in the event. Well, a concert goer or museum visitors desire to be a participant, a three-dimensional participant in, the event, in an event is no less clearly marked, but it's far more subtle. When you're in the concert hall and you have been moved, when you have been transformed, when the completion of this metamorphosis that began with this blank page, it's too easy to take it so much for granted. It's a miracle each time I step before a great piece of music. And the transformations that take place are transformations that you as an audience participate in. It's not like being there and allowing so many notes to wash over you. Even though I spend my life with my back turned to my audience, I can feel what is there. And in any group, a group in this room, there's some people who are tuned in, some people who are dozing, some people who don't understand what's going on at all. But in the concert hall when that happens, synapses are created by this person who's tuned in and this person who is and the other person who's moved and suddenly the person who is out of it feels themselves in an electronically charged environment and gradually they sit up in their seat and they say what in the hell is going on here 
And what is going on is that a connection has been made, and the connection that has been made is between the vision of the artist and your capacity to transform yourselves in receiving that message. Pete said that I had once remarked that uh, if I could make my living writing poetry, that I would do that rather than conduct. Well, of course, the phrase making a living writing poetry is in itself oxymoronic. <laughs> in fact, poets' prestige is enhanced by the degree to which they are poverty stricken. <laughs> But poets, painters, dancers, creative artists enrich our lives in ways that we never explain. We go to the concert or we go to the museum or we go to the ballet, or we go to the theater with people who know why we're going and they know why they're going. We spend our time primarily with people who say, yes, I know what you mean for whom it's not necessary to finish a sentence, rather than people are saying, who are saying, what are you talking about? And it's the people who would say, what are you talking about? That need to be reached and that can be reached. The arts in every country constitute not at all the frosting on the cake, not something on the peripheral pleasure of the entire community, but something that is very central to our lives. But if you, as custodians of the magic, when it hits you, if you don't recognize, celebrate, that you're in a house of magic when it happens, it will just pass and disappear and it will be a long forgotten, nostalgic wisp of a memory. Remember when there used to be concerts? Much like people would say, you remember when there were lamplighters? Now it's true that in the march of technological progress, there are some things that are left behind that we don't regret. Just to mention three, Stalinism, slavery, and surgery with original instruments. <laughs> we live in a very interesting period in the history of the world. Half of the world is stressing greater commonality, unions both economic and political, bringing ancient enemies together, for mutual advantage. And the rest of the world is fragmenting itself with strong desires for particularity, <coughs> segregation, and isolation. The pendulum in Hegel's dialectic is moving in multiple directions at the same time and not staying poised in either thesis or antithesis long enough for us to get our bearings. My caution is that in a technological age, we have to be careful. Everything about a symphony orchestra is antithetical to the paradigms of this day. It's labor intensive, it's non downsizable. Musicians in 1999 take as much time to do their tasks as the musicians in 1799 took. But it's not an anachronistic curiosity, a symphony orchestra. It's a non-repeatable treasure. Everybody in this room believes that participating, and I mean participating, an artistic experience is nothing more than enlightened self-interest. And there need to be more of us doing that. 
I conduct orchestras all over this country, and I'm fortunate enough to travel around the world. And I conduct some wonderful orchestras, and I see concert halls that are half-filled. The orchestra's great. Conductor's not bad. The soloist is singularly attractive. We in Oregon have a certain advantage. It's the highest per capita subscriber base of any orchestra in the United States is the Oregon Symphony. But I never come on the stage assuming that that is a given. Assuming that so many people are going to be in the hall so often. All we want to do is to have the opportunity to have as many people there to share the magic. Symphony orchestras are not anachronisms. They are time-consuming, special treasures that I hope are dispensing Velcro values in a Teflon age. I hope that those of you who have come to the Oregon Symphony concerts and who have gone to the art museum and who have gone to ballet and who have gone to theater will take it upon yourselves to bring at least once a month to these events someone who will ask you, why are we going there? Thank you. you just answered in a small part my question but in <clears throat> traveling all over and you're in you know, you're obviously intense sort of perception of things uh, have you experienced a community that seemed to just have from the souls up you know that kind of feeling that the arts are so important to their community and if you have or just in a small way have something more than we have perhaps a the thing that made that city that way, some, something we can borrow from that and help well up those feelings in Portland. Uh, recently, I was conducting the Philadelphia Orchestra and we were performing the Brahms Second Symphony, a work that I had done earlier in the year with the Boston Symphony. And because I grew up in Philadelphia, uh, I have, yes, a bias towards that orchestra. But the bias is really, um, not a bias, it's well-founded. It is a great orchestra and, and it speaks with a personality that is the legacy of Stokowski and the legacy of Ormandy. And even though the personnel has changed, when allowed to, that orchestra will repose into its rich heritage. And I stopped after we finished the first movement and I said, I don't understand. Why is it that each time I come to you and conduct, the music sounds exactly the way I have always imagined it sounding, no matter what the piece is? And I said, I conducted an orchestra to the north, an excellent orchestra, same symphony. And it was beautiful in its own way, but it wasn't this. And Louis Lanza, one of the violinists who's been in the orchestra for a while, said, Jimmy, it's the water. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not really, it's not really the water, especially those of you who have been in Philadelphia. <laughs> I assure you it's not the water, but there is a place. Uh, the obvious place, of course, is Vienna. And Vien Viennese really care about the essence of, of the musical message. I remember conducting Bruckner in, in Vienna in the Musikverein. Spectacular hall that wouldn't pass muster in any U.S. city. The seats are not comfortable. They're too close together. 
Not enough available parking. <laughs> Irrelevant. Turn off the air conditioning, and the people are silent. Another city as far away from Mexico City. Do a concert in Mexico City on the Sunday afternoon. Here are grandparents, parents, and their children. A Sunday afternoon concert. It's beautiful outside, not because it's raining. Did I say rain? <laughs> not because it's raining. Why are they there? So I said to my manager, I said, well, you must have an elaborate young people's program, educational concerts. No. Well, then the orchestra and the ensembles must go to the schools to, no. Well, why are these families here filling this hall on Sunday afternoon? And I was at a concert last week and the same thing. He says, that's what we do. We love the music and we share that love with the rest of our family who loves it as well. And whether that starts because there is an opportunity to hear the music, whether it's there because it's, it's alien and seems different, because it's, it's exotic, I don't know. But in a variety of places, that happens. The miracle is, as I go around the country, what people ask me is, how is it that you have so many people coming to concerts in Oregon? What, 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 do you, what do you folks do there? Why does that, why does that work? <laughs> and I think that it's something that you need to hold on to, maintain and make certain that people continue to come. But I think that you need to celebrate yourselves in terms of the wisdom that you evidently manifest by coming to the concerts. <laughs> Next question. Let me ask a question while uh, they're going to the mic. Um, I'm sure that when you came to Portland in 1980, you had other situations you might have gone to. What attracted you in Portland then? And you've certainly had opportunities since then. What's kept you here so long? I think that's the question that Mildred was getting ready to. <laughs> <laughs> I've only been here a few hours though. It, uh, symphony orchestras, it is a, um, it's a buyer's market. Uh, it's not a matter of a conductor saying, you know, I think I'll go and conduct in Portland. Uh, you have Cupid dolls of uh, Larry Smith and then you see that he gets kicked. No, it doesn't happen that way. What usually happens is that orchestras are in search of music directors. And it varies from time to time which orchestras are looking and, and how many of them. You have a particularly rich situation that's going on now. I was, it was the time that I came here, I was already music director in Quebec. And Michael Foxman was my mole in the organization. I knew exactly what was going on with the Oregon Symphony. I said, Michael, I have my orchestra in Quebec. I'm not looking for another orchestra. And he said, yeah, 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 but the, the musicians really want you to come. I said, Michael, I'm not interested. And then he would call, and rather than hanging up, I would listen to these updates. So he said, um, I said, well, what's the latest today? Well, um, Jimmy, I, our, our manager doesn't want you. I said, OK. I said, it's not a problem. I'm not interested in coming anyway. <laughs> He says, yeah, but the musicians, the other people. I said, well, who's, who's conducting there now? And he mentioned a conductor. Wonderful conductor. He said, and they're giving him the contributor's concert, which at that time was a very big deal. And I said, well, what's he doing in the program? Tchaikovsky Five. I said, you might as well crown this person. I said, if you're coming and you're doing a, a concert of that importance and you're doing the Tchaikovsky Fifth, how can you fail to impress? Well, one thing led to another, and I kept getting all this information. I kept telling Michael, I really am not interested. And if I'm here, it's because of Jeanette. I was in, uh, we were in Seattle, and I had gotten a call that the search committee um, had, I gather, gotten to the general manager. And the general manager, with great affability, said, oh, Jimmy, why don't, you know, the search committee, the musicians would like you to come down and, and um, 
come and interview. And I said, uh, well, I, I really, no, but you're there in Seattle, just. So I said I would, and then I said to Jeanette, no, this is ridiculous. I'm not looking for another orchestra. I'm not looking for another job. I should call them and tell them. And she said, no, you don't want to do that. Well, I came and it was a, a, a wonderful opportunity to meet people like uh, Peter Opton and, and Pierre Kolisch and Phil Bogue and many of those people who were on the board, Tim Mahoney. And uh, I was blown away by the city and the support that uh, existed here. And yes, in the intervening period, uh, there have been other orchestras that uh, have been interested. And I always felt that there was work to do here. And I said, why should I leave Oregon to go to another orchestra that I hope has the kind of credentials that we are trying to achieve here in Oregon? Uh, beautiful place to live, great audiences, great support, so why don't I stay here? There is a very interesting time, however. Currently, the New York Philharmonic, the Philadelphia Orchestra, the Cleveland Orchestra, the Cincinnati Symphony, the Indianapolis Symphony, the Atlanta Symphony, the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra are all looking for music directors. So that there is a, um, there's considerable interest and froth. <laughs> and uh, main, much of the frothing is being done by, uh, by managers and agents. Uh, but um, so far, I'm, I'm here. Okay. Ed Baraski, City Club, uh, before you answer my question, let me remind you uh, that this will be broadcast tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock on KBPS. Uh, the question is, uh, who do you think is the greatest composer of the 20th century? Well, it's an interesting question because we're in the process of presenting, I trust, over the next several years, uh, millennium masterpieces, masterpieces of all of the music that has been written for symphony orchestra and of course included in that will be the 20th century representatives and it's very very difficult um, there are several 20th century composers whose music has stood the test of time and who in the process of their writing have helped to transform the art um, stravinsky's name immediately comes to mind uh, but so does prokofiev uh, but I would think probably, in terms of the, the pervasive influence of the music, Stravinsky would probably be at the top of that list. Barbara O'Brien, City Club member. I wanted to ask you, do you think there's any chance that the symphony could perform Mahler's Third as an annual event? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure that our finance committee would really enjoy that. Um, <laughs> The Mahler, the reason I say that is the Mahler Third is a very expensive work to, to put on. And although it's not anything that we would do every year, uh, we've certainly tried to have some Mahler representation uh, each year. Uh, there are some Mahler symphonies that we have not yet done, the seventh and the eighth, for example, but I'm glad that uh, the Mahler Third is something that, uh, that finds favor with you. and. Um, it may come up before, uh, before I leave, but, uh, but certainly it's a work that deserves to be heard. It was wonderful. I, I don't think anybody even breathed. And I, I heard the, the New York Philharmonic play it at Avery Fisher Hall first, and I thought you were just absolutely fantastic. Thank you Lots very much. Lots better. Thank you. Uh, Mr. DePriest, I'm Don Sterling, a member. Um, I'm going back to your passage about the way compo uh, conductors sometimes somewhat alter the, the original writings of the, of the uh, composer. The I'm conductors, how conductors conduct alter. Yes. Um, in, in written prose, almost every writer benefits from a good editor. And in the theater and in the movies, the director is at least as powerful as the author. Uh, the, who plays that, the role of the constructive amending critic? for a musical composer? It's a very interesting uh, 
question, very often uh, the composer has the opportunity to hear a work, this happened in the case with Dvorak, with many of his symphonies and, and other composers as well. Having heard their work, they decided that there were things that they wanted to change. Rachmaninoff, for example, with his second symphony, was performed by the Philadelphia Orchestra, realized that there were passages that could be eliminated without an elemental loss of his artistic intent. Um, there is sometimes an external critic who might be a friend or a colleague, a trusted colleague of the composer. And throughout history, we have examples of composers in their letters submitting scores to their trusted colleagues and friends to ask their advice. Sometimes the advice is taken and is intelligent, and other times it merely um, conveys the bias of, of the individual. Occasionally, occasionally a music editor will say to a composer, uh, this is a little bit too long. And sometimes, sometimes conductors can operate in that fashion. I remember one time doing a work that, I, that appealed to me greatly, but there was within it, I thought, a fatal flaw. And I said to the composer, you can tell me to mind my own business, and if I want to make it a better piece to write my own music. But I said, I would really like to do this piece, and I think it can have great success if you were to do this. And this composer, either because he was hungry and wanted the work done, or because he responded to the idea that I, but I very, unfortunately what happens is very seldom do we venture into that terrain. What happens is that if, we, if there is a fatal flaw, we don't do the piece. Now there may be another composer, who, another conductor who will say, oh yeah, I like that, I don't think that that's a, a problem. Um, a case in point, ma'am, I'll, I'll be right with you. Um, I was listening with uh, Jeanette and my daughter once to uh, a work by a distinguished American composer. And I was trying to familiarize myself with this person's writing style. And we listened to composition one, composition two, and then there was this work for string orchestra. Magnificent. And this is always scary because you know that sooner or later there's going to be this first movement, second movement. Oh, this is a masterpiece. Why haven't I, why haven't I done this before? Third movement, we're all listening and just going, you know, we have been sold on this work by this composer, ready to go down any path. And then we hear something we can't imagine we're hearing. We can't believe it. And we say, well, but it's just an anomaly. And then it becomes a fugue subject and is developed and then comes back in the conclusion. And it was the theme of the Flintstones. <laughs> this is a composer, I assure you, has no television set. And I don't know if anyone else has said, you, you, don't, you, you, you don't want to have that out there. Because no one is going to listen to it saying, oh, what an interesting combination of notes. Yes, ma'am. Now I've got the theme of the Flintstones going through my head. I'm Bonita Cobe, and I've always been curious. As you're planning programs, how much weight goes into what you, as a conductor, would like to do and the musicians would like to perform? Um, what you think the audience would like and what the finance director will let you perform? Well, until recently, the finance director has had nothing to say about what we, we perform, except at the very beginning by saying, we're not gonna spend any more money than this. All conductors, all music directors work within, within the same confines. So that the object is not to break the bank, but to have something that is palatable. When I came here, there was a program committee. Peter Optin chaired that.